to celebrate and a lot going on in our community. I uh, do want to draw your attention, as we always do, to the bulletin. Any information that we have about what's going on, you can find in there. There's also a couple inserts that I'll draw your attention to a little bit later. So AC set uh, our sermon series going up to Easter, and he set it with the idea of unstuck. And if you start to think about the image of unstuck, you start to think of being stuck, right? Like it's a pretty natural progression to take. And so if you can have that image of being stuck and becoming unstuck takes a work outside of yourself, right? Becoming unstuck for people that are stuck is not something where you can just will yourself to a different place or a different part of life, but it takes a work of a force outside of yourself. And so today, as I I get to preach this week and next week, and as I get to do that, I started thinking about what is going on in my life that helps really teach about becoming unstuck and what is working through in my own personal journey to help me move forward. And, And I landed on the act and work of community. Here at New Covenant, one of the fundamental things that we're about is community, deep fellowship that is found in meeting together and gathering together. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about community today. Um, and in specific how uh, you invest into something and you are invested into by something. And that's the role of the church. And I want to start it by reading a story. Aaron Prince is a, a member of our church, part of our upper room class and just all around all-star. And uh, she wrote a post on Facebook and I'm going to read it word for word and then we're going to close in prayer and then we'll be done. Now, uh, I'm going to read it word for word because I believe the power of what she wrote is that significant. And so... Um, If it bothers you that I'm just reading, I'm so sorry, Uh, but not sorry. Here we go. When we moved back to Oklahoma, I had very few goals. We had many goals. Dan had a bucket full of goals. I personally had very few. Don't break all the babies. Remember, they had three under two that year. And make friends. Making friends as an adult is weird. I didn't excel at it while in Albuquerque. There's possibly no more awkward stage to make friends than grown, professional, new to town, single, and no kids. I would walk, jog next to a girl on the treadmill at the gym, wondering how to make a move without it feeling like I was making a move. (laughs) Weird. My bests from Albuquerque were from work, colleagues, or patients. I knew I'd have to do better in Oklahoma as there was no workplace for me. So I got creative. We joined a church soon after we moved here. I assumed it would be a great place to to make friends, and it was, but it's kind of like being the new kid at a new school. Not that we weren't welcomed or included, we were, but there were shared histories, and they all knew each other's stories. So we joined a very small Sunday school class with a few other new couples, fresh meat. I decided Jack would be my friend before she even knew my name. So kind and funny and genuine. I picked her out and then was patient. Our friendship cement came when she and her husband called two minutes before ringing the doorbell while delivering cinnamon rolls on Christmas, or around Christmas. Our house was a disaster. I hadn't showered in days. I'd just changed a dirty diaper, and it smelled like I may have rubbed it on the walls instead of just throwing it away. (laughs) The kids were half-dressed and wound, and we welcomed them in, and they, newlywed with no children, came in, sat down, and saw us. And that, my friend, is friendship cement. I stalked Sarah out at church like a coyote hunts a wounded rabbit. She was new too. She had a Gabby husband too. Sorry, Trey. She was, she had a, that's her words, not mine. Uh, well, and mine. She had a lively girl Jack's age. She wasn't in yet either. I sunk my teeth in and declared us friends. Done and done. What's your number? What are good zoo days for you? Do you like coffee and wine? Yes. Done. You're my best friend. <laughs> then my Jen. Jen made me work the hardest. I met her at a park I've come to love this approach to making friends. Her kids were playing, mine were playing, no one was touching us, we could chat. And when your kids are right there, you have plenty of things to talk about. How old are your kids? Are there any others? What other parks do you like around here? No awkwardness. Well, unless you're Aaron, then you overshare a little bit. Whatever, man. So we exchanged numbers and I walked away with high hopes. Then I texted her a few days later and crickets, nothing. I persisted and tried a few days later, a reply, the rest is history, she's my sister. Then God showed me how much he loves me and arranged many moving parts so that my best friend from college moved to town a short nine months after we moved here. Megan is my calm, she knows all the stories, she loved the new little group I'd found and they loved her back. It was like coming home. Seriously, just writing her little blurb made my fingers move more slowly and my coffee jitters subside. 
and then Carrie. Carrie was grafted in by Sarah, and I only know that because I sat and thought for a very long time. As kind and sweet and real as anyone I've ever met, it feels like she's been at the table forever. She mothers Harry and two precious big girls. The big kids rarely get to come for <laughs> Mimosa Mondays. That's the name, enjoy that one. Uh, because School, who is Jack's protege. Harry is 18 months old and hearing her stories of the struggles of mothering, that boy gives me scary flashbacks and so many smiles. I keep reminding her how cool Jack is now. This group, working moms and stay-at-homers, homeschool, public school, and private, we vary on our politics. I mean, probably, but we don't ever talk about that nonsense. Beliefs and backgrounds. But we gather as often as possible and drink whatever seems appropriate and laugh and cry and nod and wipe each other's kids' noses. Most importantly, we just hear each other. Like Glennon Melton Doyle says, we pick up the gifts of each other's stories and treat them like the presents they are. We group text ridiculous memes. I had to explain that in the first service. Memes are these pictures with funny sayings on them. I feel like they were offended. We dream of a clubhouse all our own or a vacation. And if crisis happened, these are the girls who would mobilize and get it handled. Community is a big deal. Face to face, across the table, real life community. It's when we see each other and really connect over the commonality of the human experience. So start your own Mimosa Monday or Hot Toddy Tuesday. <laughs> Listen. I'm not telling you that Aaron's telling you that. I enjoy my job. Whatever, I am partial to alliteration. R started as Monday morning mommy, moving mamas. Monday morning moving mamas, I can't help it. We met at a park and walked with our 49 children, it's an exaggeration by a few, strapped into strollers. That season of life demanded it. We've now graduated. Maybe you can only swing once a month. It's worth the effort and the awkwardness and the vulnerability, do it. Or come on over here, we love to have to get a bigger table. That's an image of community that I love. And here's Dan and Aaron's address, and so, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everybody will see you Monday. Uh, no, I love that image because it's authentic. It's real. And it's something that we can all um, be a part of. And I think that when we talk about community, there's a ton of stuff that we can deal with. And, and I can take each one of these sub points that I wrote and I can spend weeks working through them and teaching them. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the things I feel like are most important and community. And the first is the presence and place of. I feel like God is really pushing into the idea and concept of community. And here's how I know that. Number one, I get to hear stories like that. And, and that's not the end of that journey, right? And it's not the only one. I know there are tons of groups in this church, in this room right now, that happen in similar fashion and, and do the same things. People that are so tightly united that whenever things go bad or things go well, you have people to celebrate and share and cry with. So I know what's happening here and I see it and it's like a wave that's growing bigger and bigger. But here's the other way I know that, is you can see it in the secular world. You see, I'm gonna get in trouble. I can't believe I'm saying this. So I went to this place called the Patriarch uh, for total observational purposes. Uh, just trying to get sermon material, people. And so I went to this place and I say that because it's a bar. Um, but it's also a bar that does something very different. It's something very different. And what they've done is they took a house and it's just north of the post office and they remodeled the entire house. Put wood floors in or actually probably just refinished the wood floors and they have huge tables. And then they took the backyard area and they have these huge picnic type tables and they have, uh, during the winter, they have a fire pit that they've built there and all of it is surrounded and centered on community and beer. But community and beer. And so what happens is, is you see these places like that that are realizing that what people want more than just stuff is they want other people. They want community. They want relationships. They want relationships that go beyond just basic surface conversations. And I say that as well as I go to a gym where the whole premise of my gym is people loving people. Working out is secondary to being known and knowing somebody. And so the world outside of the church is pouring into this, and I feel like we'll be in trouble if the church doesn't do the same. Because what we've done in the church often is we've become a little rigid, a little country club-esque, instead of being authentic community. 
And there's a whole bunch of, of scriptural parts to this. And, and, and here's the unique thing is Jesus didn't really command it, right? It wasn't one of those things that Jesus, he, he was crucified and then he rose back from the dead and he's talking to the disciples and he says, hey, listen, this is what I need you to do now, okay? We're going to start meeting together in your family groups and your, your meeting houses. You know, eventually you'll build really nice buildings and you'll start meeting there. And, and whenever you meet, do some worship with songs, hopefully relevant to the time. Maybe do a couple liturgies. Um, make sure you pass an offering plate because, you know, we have to live. Uh, but you do all these things. And then, oh yeah, make sure you have donuts and coffee. But could, could, who can go to church without donuts? Not me. Um, it wasn't something that Jesus commanded to people. Now, he said, be united, be as one, as he and the Father are one. He said those things, but the church was an idea that came out of the reality of the way they lived life. You see, independence, the idea of doing life alone or isolated, was as foreign to the people in Jesus' time as an iPhone would be. They just didn't know how to do it. The only people that were isolated and alone in the community of Jesus were people who were either unclean because something happened to them or they were kicked out of a community as a punishment for something. Everything else they did was within community. And so when Jesus went back to heaven and he was just like, all right, do it. What did they start doing? Gathering in houses. They would still meet in the temple and they would proclaim Jesus. They would teach through the apostles' teachings. They would break bread together and they would do life together. And you see that working itself out. In Acts 4, John and Peter go before the Sanhedrin and and they are certain, because they're the same people that condemned Jesus to die, all of the believers at the time are certain that they weren't gonna come back. They were gonna go and then they were gonna be killed and that was gonna be the end. So Peter and John get spared by the Sanhedrin and, and they run back to their home where all of the people have gathered and are praying and meeting. And in that moment, the, the house was shaken. In Acts 12, it says this, when this had dawned on him, talking to Peter, he went to the house of Mary and the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance and the servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. So Peter's first place when he leaves is back to his community of believers. The same story for Paul and Silas. They came back to Lydia's house who they just baptized her whole family and moved them toward a relationship with Jesus. They get out of jail and they go back to her house to celebrate the fact that they're free. And so it was something that was so essential to who the church was that it was the first place they went to when things went wrong. Excuse me. You see, there's a reason for this. They believe in a culture of what we call interdependence. You see, we as Americans and as really as a world in the last hundred plus years have really begun to develop an idea of independence. Like everything is about the individual. And it's very hard for us to put ourselves in the context of the early church and to understand the importance of community because we have really been told and oriented that it's about us, that we are the center of the world and take care of yourself and other people should take care of themselves, but that's such a foreign concept to them. And I gave this description in the first service, and I probably said it again. If you think about your houses, right, we build huge master suites, and then we deck out our backyard so we don't have to talk to anybody, right? Nobody? (laughs) That's my story. I guess I'm the only one confessing today. Uh, Good to know. You know, or we can control who comes to our backyard, you think, at least, right? So that's what happens is we become so inward focused and so individualized that we, we struggle with this idea of interdependence. And I think God wants to shift that in us. And so I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk about the power and purpose of community. If we look at James 5, the the passage that Angela just read for us, it says in those words that, that if you're sick, you should gather the elders. Confess your sin and ask for healing to the people in your community, and you will be both healed and forgiven. So the power, first and foremost, in community is the power to heal and to forgive. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. So think about that. The power to heal and forgive is found in the way you talk, confess, and ask for prayer of the people in your life. Well, why? It goes back to the purpose of our community. The number one purpose of community is to reveal God to people. 
we, when we gather together, when I hear Aaron's story and, and the tale of what's going on in that life, you know what's happening to the people in that group and the people who read that story, which has been shared dozens and dozens of times, everything that's happening there is God, Jesus Christ, is being revealed to people whether or not they realize it. Because God is active and alive in the work of that house and the fellowship that's taking place. So the number one purpose of community is to reveal God to people. I go back to Acts 2 whenever I think about that. This is what it says, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So this is the descriptor of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's two really unique things out of that that give us another idea of the purpose of community. Is Number one is they took care of each other. So it reveals God, that's the first and foremost, but they also came together and took care of one another. Anybody that had need, they sold their stuff, they brought it in together and they distributed it so that nobody in the community had need. And then beyond that is how it ties up. Luke, when he wrote that passage, he says that, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's something that's profound from the scripture, not from me. (laughs) Your community is one of the most effective evangelistic tools in the church. The way you love one another and the depths of, of what goes wrong and what goes right in your life, the way you love one another shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with people around you. Because here's the thing, in that passage, they didn't have big fancy buildings, They didn't have lights and worship like we have it. You know, they didn't have donuts and coffee as much as I'm joking about that. They didn't have those things that we feel like are important to reach out to people. What they had is an authentic enough community that anybody that saw it says, I want to be a part of that. Right? Doesn't it sound great? We were having this conversation on Wednesday night in our midweek class, and I was talking about ways that... the last session was about, by a guy named Jay Baker, who's Jim and Tammy Faye Baker's son, and he just had a horrible experience in the church and left and felt like it was all about judgment and hate and all these things, and he just was done. And he came back because of scripture. And so we started the conversation with our group asking, well, how do you welcome back prodigals? What's the way to invite a prodigal home? And I think part of it would be inviting them to a church community. I think that's a big deal. But what happens and what is probably more effective is to invite people into your community. Are you good at cooking or not even good? Can you order out well? (laughs) Order some food, cook some food, and invite somebody to come over. It is way easier for somebody who has a rough church history or no church history to come to your house as the middle ground to inviting them to church. Right? When you say that, like if any of you have walked through that experience where you have wandered or you've left the church or you had burned out experience or whatever, like isn't it far easier to go to somebody's house and, and to see the power of forgiveness, healing, and the purpose of God in it and the evangelistic aspect of community? Isn't it far easier to be in that moment than to be invited to church? Now, both of them are incredibly important. But for some people, that, they need that middle space of, of relationship and community before they're invited to a deeper commitment. And so that's what I believe the power and purpose. And so I want to talk about just some fundamental pieces of how to community, right? That's for all you grammar people just to know how much I just want to spite you. I'm just kidding. No, I just want to tell you real quick how to community. I think the fundamental aspect of it has to be authenticity and transparency, You have to come with all you are. The only way for community to be as full as it is, to be as deep and as powerful as God is making it, is for you to come with all of your stuff. 
The church I uh, experienced when I was in high school and grew up in, there was a Sunday school. It was a real big Sunday school, you know, one of the real foundational pieces of the church. And there was a couple that was going through a divorce. And they would come on Sunday morning and act as if everything was normal. How broken is that? This is the group of people that want to walk with you through this, and you're hiding it. And so authenticity, transparency, community is based in its fullest and its strongest whenever we bring all of our jacked up parts of life in, and the community loves us in spite of it and helps us through it. The second thing is consistency. Being present matters. Being present matters. And and real quick, this isn't my ploy to make sure that you're here every week to come to church. Like, I would love that. I love it when you're here, all of you. Um, But What matters is relationship and community, and relationship doesn't happen if you spend one two-hour session every six weeks with somebody. That's not community. Consistency builds relationship. Relationship builds authenticity, which builds community. The next one is you've got to learn how to manage tensions of grace and accountability. Managing the tension of grace and accountability. We talk about this all the time in our faith is, is there's moments in community where you have to tell people that the way they're living, the things they're doing are going to destroy them. And there's times when people come into your community and what they need is for you to say, in spite of what you've done or what you're doing or what you will do, God loves you. Both of those are fundamental and community. You've got to learn how to navigate that to when people come in and they need grace and then you give them grace and you give them grace and you lead them accountability. And we all do this. Like we all have an idea of how this should be the way we function because that's how we treat our kids. Don't you learn how to walk the tension of discipline and grace with your children? And you know the people that haven't? Right? All of you are at the restaurant and you're like, that kid needs a little bit of discipline, Right? And if you're not laughing, then I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, so think about that. In, in your life, you discipline your children. You create boundaries around them in order to what? To love them, to show them a better way of living because you know that if you create these boundaries and you push them in the direction that is healthy and right for their life, that they don't have to go through the stuff that you did. I feel like that's my number one goal with my son is like avoid all the things and the stupid stuff I did, right? Right? And more than likely, he's still going to do a majority of it because we're humans and we're flawed. But you balance that tension of grace and accountability, and it's no, difference, no different in community. Uh, this last part I think is important, and Nathan helped me figure out these three ways to define this. And, and it's important to remember that community is not a one-way path. And I'm, I'm saying that to say that there's three types of people within community, broad generalizations, right? That's what I'm saying. But there's three different types of people in a community. Number one, there's a leech. Everybody knows what a leech is. The leech is the person that shows up and it's always about what you can do for me. What can you do for me? You can do, and they're just taking and they're taking and they're taking and they're taking. And everybody wants to remove leeches, right? And so if that person is dominating a group, it begins to fracture that group from within the inside. And so work hard to not be a leech. Now here's the truth is, is you're going to fluctuate between different sides of that. There's going to be times where you show up to community, and this is natural. This is the expectation for community. You're going to be able to show up, and you're going to have these moments where you really need. And I, well, I, need I just need love, and I need grace, and I need, I need, I need, I need. But the key is that it's not a one-way street, that you balance that out by also being somebody that's giving and pouring into a community. The second one is Turtles. Um, we all know turtles, right? They, whenever something happens, life gets tough, they get scared, they retract into their shell. And that's what can also be devastating to a community because what happens for a turtle is they don't want to ever go below the surface. They don't want to ever be honest or real about what they're going on or going through. And so, so there's no depth that's built. There's none of this authenticity, transparency. There's none of that happening because they've pulled into their shell when things gone bad and all you're sitting there doing is tapping on it and asking for them to come out and be who they are with you. And the last one is peacocks. Think big feathers, right? They're the dominators. They're gonna come to the group and it's all gonna be oriented around them. They always have the right opinion, the right thought, the right word. They're the one that knows the answers because we've done it, we've walked through it, we do it right. 
And you've got to figure out how to balance that. Because here's the deal, some people need that sometimes in community, but that's all you do every time you're a part of a community at a house or here on a Sunday school or on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night or a Sunday night. If that's your role in that situation, you need to be broken of that. Because what happens for a peacock is you put up the feathers to avoid the reality of what's happening behind. Right? Sometimes we project this idea that we have it all together because we know that if we're exposed, people will realize we don't. And so you have to be careful. You have to be careful. And you walk through those tensions in that way too where you're, you're constantly evaluating who you are. And, and, and here's the deal. The only way that can happen is if you're open to accountability. Accountability isn't just understanding when I can say things and when I can't. It's understanding that sometimes if you're going to be real in a community, you have to hear hard things and not run away. I think this is the hardest thing in the church today is, is the first sign of us being called to accountability, we're out. Because there's a thousand churches we can go that will let us be ourselves without asking us to be something different. You know, so we're calling somebody to accountability. Well, I don't like the way he said that to me, and so I'm going somewhere else. Like, community means that I'm in no matter what. And so here's where I want to end. I want to end with a caution. And I'm going to read with finishing this story. So Sarah Thompson, who's also a member here, is part of that group with Aaron and the girls. And, and she responds by saying this. She reposted it on Facebook, and then she said this. We moved back. When we moved back to Oklahoma City, it took me a very long time to find friends. I was so lonely, so pregnant, and so over the church, so over the church we were at, and no one would talk to me. I declared I wasn't going to church anymore, but husband found new covenant, and I consequently was found by the fun friends that I'd been praying for. These gals, I mean, I can't even. I found my people and it had solidified my belief that one should never, never do life or motherhood without a tribe. We have evolved from working out to just drinking mimosas and workout clothes, but it works. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Here's the deal. That was one of the proudest moments of my work in the church, to be able to read those two stories and to see the work and how many times people resonated with and agreed with that. But here's the caution. So there are people in this room who have been going here for years that don't know that experience. There are people in this room who have tried and tried to get connected and because for some reason or another they just don't feel like this is their tribe. And I, I love what's happening on Mimosa Mondays and I know there's another two Bible studies that happen here on Mondays and, but if we can't be more open and inviting to new people and people that don't look like us. And that's the hardest thing is we, we clump into these little demographic groups and that's normal, that's natural, but there's gonna be people coming through the door that don't fit our demographic and what are we supposed to say? Sorry, you don't fit our group, go find another church. We orient our community around inviting and welcoming somebody else and somebody new into it. We have to. It's the way of the church. It's an invitational thing. They did everything here to welcome people of all different faiths. And I mean, think about it. So Jesus was Jewish, and the ministry of Jesus in the initial phase was Jewish, and then all of a sudden Jesus said, no, 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 no. It's way bigger than that. We're bringing in the Gentiles, which is us. You don't think it was hard for them to realize that we got to step? I mean, it is. Like Paul and Peter fight about how hard it was to include people that were different than them into the faith, but they did it. And we are here as the fruit of that reality. And so our position in community should be one of outward focus. How are we inviting people into it? And here's the other aspect of that. Some of you have been here for a while and you can't find somewhere to plug in. It's time for you to create something. Let's do it. We're not going to create a group for you. I mean, we can try, but we're going to miss it because we don't know you fully. You know you fully. We, you know what you like to do, the things you love, the things you like to talk about, the things you like to study. Help us create a group for you. And here's the other thing I want to, just a, a message of hope for you is if you've been coming here and you haven't felt welcomed, you haven't felt like you've had a chance to connect or nobody's saying hi to you, please, please hold on because we're coming. We're trying to figure this thing out. We're not perfect. 
That's what makes this place so beautiful and wonderful. As we're not perfect, we never pretend to be, but we're coming for you. And we're gonna figure out a way to connect with you where you are. We wanna invite you in a community. And we want Jesus to reign in your heart through the way that we love you and you love us.